All right, so everyone, welcome to the first Stochastics and Statistics Seminar of the semester. So it's uh, great that we can still do these and have a spate of exciting talks this semester. We're thrilled to have Jerry Lee kicking it off. Jerry's no stranger to MIT. Actually, he worked with me when he was a graduate student, and he did all kinds of exciting stuff on algorithmic robust statistics. It won the George M. Sproul's Award. And um, you know, a lot of the stuff that he started in his thesis, tons of people have been working on since. So I'm really excited to hear you know, the latest and greatest in this area, uh, simpler and faster algorithms for list learning. Oh, great, thanks for the nice introduction. Yes, that is back. it's great to be like at least virtually back at MIT. Um, so yeah, this is joint work with uh, Ilias, uh, Dirk Nicholas, Daniel Kane, Daniel Kongsgaard, uh, and Kevin Tian, who uh, was my intern last summer. Ooh. All right, so uh, before I start like talking about what list learning is, let me first recap sort of this, you know, the traditional view of robust statistics, which is something that as Ankur mentioned, I've worked on quite a bit. This really goes back to, you know, these questions from the 60s, um, you know, from, you know, real statisticians who asked, you know, given a data set which has been corrupted by a very small fraction of adversary outliers, how can you recover information about uncorrupted, about the uncorrupted data set? All right, so the, sort of the picture is the following. You have the data set where the vast majority of it is still good, right? We're, but where a small but constant fraction, let's say like 10% of the, of the data is adversarially chosen and potentially, you know, bad, trying to fool your algorithm. Uh, and you're given this data without perhaps, you know, you know, the colors. And your goal is to essentially remove the influence of the small fraction of outliers from your data set. Okay, so this is a very well-studied problem. It turns out that until very recently, there's still lots of very interesting, well, I guess there's still very many, very interesting algorithmic questions for this problem, especially as we go into high statistics or high dimensions, excuse me. Uh, but in this talk, we're gonna be considering a very different regime where rather than having you know, more in liars and outliers, we can consider this seemingly impossible regime where there are many more outliers than in liars. So the picture looks like this rather than uh, the picture before. And now it's sort of, at least a priori already kind of clear that there's no well-defined single answer. In the sense that if I remove these colors and ask you to identify which one is a good cluster, um, of course, you know, I can't tell you because each one of these three clusters could be the truth. Uh, sort of they're all, they all have, you know, they could all have the same structure in general, you know, I could just have translated versions of good, of the good data set. Um, and they're all sort of all clustered, but sort of well separated. And so there's no way of telling you which way, which one is the grand truth. Uh, but one could hope that maybe this is the only thing that an adversary could do. Uh, one could hope that maybe all they could do is just sort of translate your answer by in, in a couple of different directions. And then Therefore, one could just at least output a small list of candidate answers. You know, maybe at least in, for instance, in this case, there would be three candidate answers sort of given by these three clusters, right? So this is sort of the objective of list learning. Um, I guess this is inspired also by sort of this work on list decodable, uh, you know, coding, this kind of stuff. And it turns out that in this setting, essentially this is possible that really the worst thing that the adversary could do is really uh, what I've, highlighted, really all they can do is sort of uh, confuse you a little bit and you can actually recover a short list uh, containing all of the candidate answers. Or sorry, a short list of candidate answers such that one of the candidates is close to the ground truth. Okay, so more formally, there's, there's many settings that one can consider, but this is the setting I will consider in this talk, which is a very well studied setting. Uh, I will let S be a subset of RD of size N. And I will assume that there is a subset T of the set satisfying two properties. First of all, the, the, the size of this set T, which is I will call the good points, um, is at least a one over K fraction of the size of S uh, for some integer K. And also the uh, empirical covariance of the set T is uh, spectrally bounded. So all the eigenvalues of the covariance are at most something like sigma squared. Given this, the goal will be the following. We will let mu star denote the expectation or the empirical mean of this set T. And the goal is to output a list of order K candidates 
uh, mu1 through mu n such that one of these candidates is close in L2 norm to the truth, where here close I will, know, uh, I will say means sigma root k. Then it turns out that this is sort of the right answer. And I guess since this is the statistics and stochastics, or stochastics and statistics, well, st the stochastics uh, is, is in the title. I should point out that this is sort of a deterministic problem, but of course we're interested in this because this is, um, this is what results when I take something like D samples from a distribution, or sorry, this set T is a result of taking D samples from a distribution with bounded covariance. So, but you know, for all intents and purposes, this is the deterministic problem that we're gonna consider. But this is a, the deterministic regularity conditions that we will require. Gary, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So like, I mean, if I do these decodable codes, presumably if you give me a list, I can just scan through the list and see if one of them makes sense and the other ones just don't in the, in the scope that I have. How do I sort through the list that you give me for this problem? So in this setting, you, you can't, um, in the sense that like all, all, all the candidate answers are like all equally valid. If I, but if I give you, you know, a little bit of additional outside information, like for instance, like a small number of verified data points, which I know are from the ground truth, then I can typically sort through this. I can like figure out which one is the ground truth. Otherwise, um, I'll give you an example very briefly where this is just impossible. There's no sense in which there's like actually one clear example okay. or a clear yeah. truth. But I think it's maybe, I mean, that's a great question. One of the things that's maybe worth emphasizing, so in the usual coding setting, um, you know, there's no way to tie break within the list. They're all uh, code words that, you know, are close to what you observe. But one of the sort of home run applications of that is really in complexity theory, where you can then uh, sometimes depending on the way that you're using, you know, the encoding and the list decoding, you can then, you know, post process the list and check which of them are the right answer, because it's some kind of like one way function. So it's really that it plugs into some downstream application is kind of the spirit of it. Yeah, that's right. But uh, that, I was asking what is the downstream application in, in statistics, I guess. Yeah. So I guess I, I'll get into that, but I guess the, the short answer is that, well, I guess I'll get into it in like a couple seconds, but it's, right, it's for clustering mixture model, essentially. Okay, so uh, I should pause, by the way, the, there's, there are a couple of sort of weird looking um, or potentially arbitrary looking uh, parameters here, like this order K and the sigma root K. Um, it turns out these things are essentially necessary. So just a couple of quick notes. Uh, in, in the literature, in, in general, you'll typically see the parameterization of alpha being one over K rather than, instead of using K. But in this talk, I think it, it's a little bit more natural because we're gonna go things in a kind of higher level to just consider uh, this one over K parameterization. Uh, this list size of omega of K is necessary as well as in the show. And this error of also sigma root K is also unavoidable under these assumptions. Although I won't, I won't show this, but it's, it's very easy to show. Um, there, there's very straightforward examples, even in like one dimension. Um, and of course, there's other interesting settings, like you don't have to do just mean estimation. You can do all these sorts of other uh, regression tests or other statistical tests. And also, since everything is scale invariant throughout the talk, I will just assume the sigma is equal to one. Okay, so any questions so far? Or any other questions? No, let me just... Keep going and yeah, so this is going back to Philippe's question. So I think that the main application of this stuff is really into understanding mission models. So list learning can really be thought of as a natural generalization um, in the robust setting of clustering well-separated mixtures of K distributions, which is a really well-studied problem in learning theory. And sort of the reason why it's the case is as following. So you know, here's a graphical cartoon of an instance of a mixture model. So you know, I have here, the setting is I have you know, K distributions. Each one of them are nice in the sense that each one of them have bounded covariance and they're well separated. Okay. And why is this uh, you know, related to list learning? Suppose I just run a list learning instance or algorithm on this instance. Uh, well, so the, goal, the, the list learning guarantee is that it's going to output a list of order K hypotheses such that one of them is close to the truth. But what is the truth in this case? Um, you know, each one of these clusters could be considered the truth because they're all nice. They all satisfy the requirements of T, right? So when I run my list learning algorithm, my list of hypotheses must therefore contain an answer which is close to one, uh, each one of these 
uh, clusters or components. And it turns out that like, you know, by a little bit of very classical or very standard post-processing, I can get essentially the clusters from, from these candidate names. Okay, so in this sense, you can think of list learning as sort of a, the robust version of sort of learning mixture models, or well-separated mixture models. Okay, so hopefully that motivates the problem. Uh, and of course there's other applications as well. So for instance, one very natural application of this is uh, clustering mixture models where now additionally, I have a little bit of noise. So, you know, there's an epsilon fraction of noise um, like so. So there's a small fraction of outliers from this mixture model setting. And now when I apply a list learning algorithm, sort of the list learning algorithm only sees one versus the rest anyways, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really require the, the structure of, you know, the points being truly uh, a mixture of K things. It really just says that there is some one over K fraction of points, which are um, nice. And so from the perspective of the list learning algorithm, sort of these red points really don't matter in some sense. So if I run my list learning algorithm, it's still gonna output uh, a list of, you know, order K hypotheses, such that you know, this list contains something which is close to each one of these true names. So this is one application. Um, and this is another sense in which it's really the robust generalization of clustering mixture models. And as I mentioned before, uh, this is also one application is a semi-verified learning. So here, here the setting is, you know, I have a small fret, I have, you know, this data that I have generated, but it's sort of, I've generated in some, you know, perhaps un completely untrustworthy way. Maybe I, I, I hired a bunch of people for MTurk um, to run my data, but I don't really, I can't really vet them because, you know, it costs a lot of money. I can only hire like a couple of experts, you know, who I really trust the answers to. So what I can do here, for instance, is run my list learning algorithm um, to output a small list of hypotheses or candidate hypotheses, and then use my small number of experts to break ties. This is related to what I was mentioning before. Right? And then in that way, I can use my, the, the small number of uh, experts actually has a lot more sort of power in the sense that I can use them much more effectively rather than just trying to like, uh, you know, maybe I have way too few uh, sort of experts to actually learn anything, but I can use them in this way to just you know, break the symmetry. And there's also applications to other things like stochastic block models and other things, uh, but I won't get into them for now. I think, really, I think this, this example of clustering well-separated mixture models is sort of what I would like to keep as sort of the running example throughout this talk. And I, it really is sort of, um, yeah, the most important, I think, visualization. So hopefully that answers your question, Philippe, from a little bit ago. Could you say something about, what do you mean by learning uh, applications to stochastic block models? Or, or are these in settings where um, the degree is quite high or, I mean, they're not in the sparse setting, are they? So I, I think it's typically in the setting where there's many communities. Um, you can think of like stochastic learning stochastic block models. Like the, the samples really are sort of, it, it's, it's, um, it is a clustering problem, right? Just in a slightly different norm. Um, like it's like an L1 norm rather than L2 norm. Uh, and you can still use many of the techniques from sort of this literature in that setting as well. I don't think they get the, the precisely, you know, high thresholds, but you can still use them in some settings where I think just mm -hmm. launch. Okay, cool. So I was known about this problem before. So I should say this was, uh, this setting was introduced in a paper by Charakar Steinhardt Valiant in 2017. And uh, they also in that same paper gave a polynomial time algorithm for this learning that gave nearly optimal rates in terms of um, both sample complexity in the stochastic case and also uh, error. So I think what they're, instead of getting sigma root k, they get like sigma root k up to like some log factor. More recently, uh, there are two papers, uh, one by Chair Panamjiri, Mohanty, and Yao, uh, and one by a subset of the authors who get faster run times. Oh, but I should say, sorry, the CSV algorithm, while it is polynomial time, it really is like a heavy duty polynomial time. Like it uses these black box STP solvers and all these sorts of things. So the runtime is quite slow. Um, but more recently, and there's these two algorithms. So the, the algorithm by Chair Panamjiri, Mohanty, and Yao runs in 
O to O of n, b, k to the c time. So uh, for some you know, large constant c, I think we worked out to be something like nine or eight. Um, but so that means when k is constant, so when, is, when k is not too large, when uh, the fraction of good points is a relatively large fraction of the data, this is actually near linear time. On the other hand, um, you know, when k is sort of kind of large, this could blow up very, you know, even, even if k is some like small polynomial, like uh, d to the point 0.1, something like this, or I guess maybe larger than d to the point 0.1, but d to the you know, root, root d or whatever, then this uh, runtime can be, is a little bit prohibitive. There's also uh, another algorithm by a subset of the authors that gave a runtime which is n squared d k squared. Um, and this also got nearly optimal rates, but of course, you know, this is still somewhat slow, especially in high dimensions. You know, so, but this is already, you know, quite good. They're not like, you know, terrible runtimes, but what, so like, what, what am I talking about? Um, I think there's still a number of interesting questions that the previous work didn't, uh, or left, an, uh, left unanswered. So sort of the first motivation is that None of these algorithms, I would claim, are really the, the quote unquote, you know, the book algorithm. I don't claim that ours is the book algorithm either, but they're all quite complicated. Um, and, you know, their analyses are, are quite involved and in some sense quite brittle, right? And this is somewhat unsatisfying. The, the, the problem itself is very easy to state. One would like sort of the right algorithm for this problem. It seems like, you know, you should try to get um, the book algorithm for this problem. I, again, I don't claim that we get the book algorithm, but we have a very nice algorithm, I, I would say. Um, additionally, you know, from a more practical point of view, a simple algorithm, as opposed to these somewhat more involved algorithms, is much more likely to work well in practice. Um, just because, I mean, that's, you know, something that is very easy to code and doesn't, you know, use all these different hacks is going to probably work well. And finally, sort of uh, the ulterior motive is that getting the quote unquote right algorithm can also give us insights into proving the state of affairs in a more quantitative sense. And this is sort of a lead in into the second uh, motivation, uh, which is, you know, we can, there's still room to hope that one can improve the runtime. So for instance, for even this, uh, this simple case of clustering mixture models, like sort of the special case that I mentioned before, this is a very well studied problem. And the runtime of this, uh, or the fastest algorithm for this, is a very classical, very simple algorithm due to Vimpala Wong. It's just you take KPCA essentially, then do some basic uh, clustering on the subspace. And the runtime of this is just O tilde and DK, because that's the runtime of KPCA. So, you know, doing anything faster would at least require, would already be a sort of a, a breakthrough for this simpler problem, but one can at least hope to match this runtime, right? And the previous algorithms did not. And it seemed like they did not do so for fairly fundamental reasons. Um, so the the you know the first algorithm, it seemed like was not the right approach. It really needed these heavy duty optimization tools, essentially black box SDP solvers. The paper by uh, Dick, Nicholas, Kane, and Kongsgaard sort of only looks at one dimensional projections, and really you know there's fundamentally k dimensional information. Somehow it seems like hard to do this efficiently. It's, it's hard to state this, but their algorithm is at least uh, stated, it doesn't seem to do this quite right. And also the paper by Cherepanam Jerry, Mohanta, Mohanti and Yao, well, there's sort of a, there's two, two reasons why it seems like it's, not, it's hard to get the right runtime. First of all, their algorithm only ever finds one cluster at a time. So, you know, what they do is they find one cluster, peel it off, then find another cluster, then peel it off and repeat this process K times. Um, and if you do so, you're probably going to run, end up with some sort of k-squared bottleneck. It's because, you know, even finding a single cluster probably takes ndk time. And so repeating this process k times, you're going to already lose some factors in k. And, you know, another sort of fundamental problem is that the optimization problem that they end up solving is some complex sort of hacking instance. And all, all known solvers for that problem require, you know, fairly, fairly, you're gonna lose a lot of K factors when you try to solve those problems. So, and again, the reason I guess is that they're, they're not really doing sort of the right thing for the optimization problem. And this is one of the things that we're able to fix. Okay, so now uh, let me talk about what we did. So the first quote unquote theorem, it's not really a theorem, but uh, 
is that there's a simple algorithm with which with a real relatively self-contained, I think like three page analysis as opposed to like the I don't know, 20 page proofs before um, that run in time O tilde n squared dk. So not quite near linear time, but it achieves nearly optimal error. Okay, but it, it's just a much simpler algorithm. And again, I don't want to claim that it's the book algorithm, but it is definitely my view a much nicer algorithm than the previous state of affairs. And um, my goal of this talk, in fact, is to more or less present a self-contained proof of correctness for this simple algorithm. And then building upon this uh, theorem, uh, we show that there's an algorithm which runs in near linear time, so or O tilde NDK, so matching the runtime of KPC, uh, which achieves sort of the near the optimal error. And if you allow for this K to the sixth additional runtime, this algorithm also achieves optimal error. So you can also remove the logs from the error as well. Okay. And a couple of notes about this. So first of all, the insights for the simple algorithm are really crucial for developing the fast algorithm in the, in the sense that um, really what, what you do to develop the fast algorithm is just take the primitives developed in the simple algorithm and, and combine them with these more sophisticated optimization techniques um, to run faster. Uh, and you really need sort of the right way of phrasing the algorithm. So really, I think the, the way of, you know, the way that we sort of reframe the problem in the simple algorithm is really crucial to getting this fast algorithm. And it's also just used as a black box within the faster algorithm. So there's that as well. Uh, I should also say, you know, this k to the sixth is a bit weird, but uh, you can always think essentially that um, d is at least k um, and n is at least uh, k squared. So n d k is already something like k to the fifth. So, you know, this k to the sixth is really not that bad. I think it only becomes the dominating term when k is quite small, something like d to the one half. And even there, uh, the latter algorithm improves upon the state of the state of the art in all regimes. And of course, if you remove the sort of the k to the sixth, then ndk is always the fastest. Okay, so are there any questions about sort of the statement of these results? If not, I will move forward. Okay, cool. So now uh, the rest of the talk is gonna be split into two unequal parts. I think uh, my goal is going to be to essentially, as I mentioned before, describe in essentially all the detail, uh, the simple algorithm, because I think it is easy to communicate. And then very briefly, or I don't really expect to really get anything meaningful out of this, I'll describe how to make it fast or just you know, flash those slides given the time situation, just because that's where sort of all the technical, I mean, there's a lot of technical work there that is hard to convey in an hour long talk. But if you understand the simple algorithm by the end of this talk, I'll be very happy. Okay, so the basis for this uh, simple algorithm is sort of three simple geometric facts. Well, I guess three increasingly non-trivial geometric facts. The first fact is almost entirely trivial, which is that if instead of wanting something like root k error, uh, you just want root dimension error, then you, you're done. You, you can just randomly sample something like order k points and you're done with high probability. And the proof of this is very straightforward. Uh, by Chebyshev's inequality applied to like the L2 norms, uh, a constant fraction of the points are within something like order root d of their empirical mean because you know they have bounded covariance. So that means with very high probability, you will sample one of them after sampling order k points from the overall data set at random. And therefore you're done with probably at least 0.99. If you want, uh, you can also make this deterministic and you can also boost these probabilities to you know, much higher. But you know, for the sake of this talk, I think this is a simple enough demonstration. As an additional corollary of this, uh, if instead of just wanting to solve the problem in, in the entire dimensional space, you just want to solve the problem in order k dimensions, you're also done. And that's just because you can, in, the su in this uh, you know, subspace, k is, or the dimension is order k, and we want it order root d, so you're done. Right? So fairly straightforward, hopefully. OK, cool. The second fact is slightly more non-trivial, but I, I think also just maybe like one line of algebra. Uh, 
if I have a subset of the good points, so T prime, uh, and recall that the covariance of the good points is bounded in spectral norm. So it has all eigenvalues at most one. Then you have the following fact, which is that the covariance of the, the subset has uh, all eigenvalues which are most so the size of T over the size of T prime. So one over the fraction of the points in T prime. All right, so another, this is a fairly, hopefully you believe this. I'm not gonna like show the calculation, but it's like one page, one like line. The idea is the following. You're, you're still taking the average over all things in T prime. There's one term, which is that you're centering uh, at different points, but it turns out that this can never hurt you. But the only difference is that I'm weighting up, you know, the contribution of all the points in T prime by a factor of, a relative factor of, you know, size of T over size of T prime, just because instead of dividing in the end, you know, taking the average of one, one over size of T, I'm dividing by one over size of T prime. And so this is really the only difference. Okay, so hopefully you believe this. This is nothing magical happening. And the third fact um, is, the, I guess, the really only non-trivial fact that we will use. Um, and this is a uh, sort of been already studied in the previous work. This is sort of the geometric basis behind all the everything that's going on in this uh, sort of line of work, which is that the following. Suppose I have a subset S prime of S and let T prime denote the set of points in T which are within this subset S prime. Then we have the following, which is that the L2 distance between the true mean and the empirical uh, mean of S prime can be upper bounded by the following quantity, uh, the square root of this. So I think for the purposes of the talk, it's probably good to just ignore the second term and just focus mostly on the first term. This is where the action is really happening. Um, this is a, the spectral norm of the covariance of S prime times uh, the size of S prime over the size of T prime. So one over the fraction of points, which are good in this subset. And then there's also this other term, which is size of S over size of S prime times one over K. Okay, so this is a little bit uh, the proof of this is, I should say, is, is still relatively straightforward. It's a little bit you know, non-trivial to, uh, to understand why this is true. But essentially, you know, um, the thing that one worries about is like maybe there's like two very far apart clusters or something. Um, but if there's two very far apart clusters in S prime, and T prime is one of them, then this covariance will have very large spectrum. Norm. So this is intuitively why this is true. Okay. Um, and Terry, there's a question in the chat from Elkanon. Oh, uh, I can't see the chat, unfortunately, right now. So the question is, S prime can be chosen after seeing the realization of the sample or before? After. So this is for any set S prime. So there, there's nothing, uh, at this point, there's nothing like stochastic about, you know, this lemma. This is just a purely geometric lemma about any set of points. But yeah, so one, one nice sanity check um, of this lemma is that if the covariance of S already by itself is already bounded, it's like order one, then the uh, distance between the empirical mean of the overall set of points, not just, you know, yeah, just everything, to mu star is already pretty close. It's already at most order root k. And that's easy to check, right? Just because if you just plug in S into here, this, the, this term is order one by assumption. And size of S over size of T is at most K by assumption. And this term is negligible. So overall, this, this is already at most uh, order root K. So if the, empirical, if the empirical covariance of your overall set of points is bounded, you're already done, which is kind of nice. Okay. So how, how should we use this? Well, looking at this sort of form of the lemma, it presents a really natural idea. Maybe we should just, you know, try to make whatever this quantity is as small as possible. So what if we just try to iteratively remove points such that the covariance, uh, the special norm of the covariance just keeps decreasing. The problem of course is that there's this other term, this annoying term, which is the one over the fraction of points, the good points that remain. Um, and you, you need to make sure that this is not blowing up. And in general, you can't ensure that this is happening. So a simple example that illustrates this is consider there's two very, very well separated, um, you know, 
sets of points such that each individual cluster of points is good. So it has bounded covariance. And this is my data set. If I want to remove, if I want to decrease the overall spectral norm of this data set, it's not too hard to see that I have to remove at least one of these two clusters. Because if, if you know, two points remain from, or if one point remains from each cluster, that's already going to contribute a huge uh, contribution to the spectral norm just because they're like super far apart. But if I remove any one of these clusters, I, I could just say after the fact that you know my good set was the set of points I removed. Right? In some sense, it was always the good set. But then this quantity obviously goes to infinity. So in general, I can't sort of ensure that I'm decreasing the covariance while maintaining all the good points. Hopefully that makes sense. And more generally, you know, I had two clusters here, but I can always have, I could have like K candidate directions. So, you know, because I have a one over K fraction of points, I could do this in sort of K directions all at once. Um, and so, yeah. But this sort of suggests something, maybe that's again, the worst case, maybe that's all the adversary can do. So what if I just try to remove points such that the covariance keeps decreasing outside of this order K subspace? or outside of some order k subspace. And the point is that this is still good enough because inside the subspace, you know, the subspace is low dimensional and then you can use the first fact to, to randomly sample within the subspace um, to learn a good list of hypotheses. And if you can, outside of the subspace, reduce the spectrum of the covariance to like good enough, then fact three says, you know, the empirical mean is close to the truth um, outside of the subspace. And then you can just you know, stitch it together using you know, Pythagorean theorem. And it turns out that this is going to be the overall sort of strategy. But I want to emphasize it is like it's, you need to be careful here, and we'll, we'll do so. At a high level, um, there's some sort of you know balancing act that's going to go on because as I remove points uh, from S, you might can also remove some good points, and it's going to make that's going to make it harder in general to decrease the special number of the covariance. But some like magical sort of parameter balancing happens, and it turns out that. You can, we, we will remove points in a way that ensures that the fraction of good points actually increases as we do this removal procedure, which is kind of surprising. Um, so let me just explain the overall idea here. So the main uh, thing that we will ensure is this sort of saturation condition. Okay, so definition, we say a subset S prime of S is saturated with respect to S if we have the following slightly weird looking condition. If the fraction of good points, uh, so that remain, so the size of t prime over t, is at least square root of the size of s prime over the size of s. Okay, so if the fraction of good points that remain is at least a uh, square root of the fraction of overall points that remain. Okay, a weird looking definition, but a fully well-formed definition. I'll also let beta throughout this talk denote uh, the fraction of points that remain. So size of S prime over S. Okay, note that the uh, saturation composes very naturally. Um, so in other words, if S prime is saturated with respect to S and S double prime is saturated with, with respect to S prime, then S double prime is saturated with respect to S as well. Okay. And we will need a couple of uh, conditions about this saturated subset or uh, just in general. The first condition is that saturated sets cannot be too small. Okay, uh, another, they have to be at least a one over k squared fraction of the overall set of points. Uh, and to see this, I mean, in some sense, there's nothing you can do. I have one property, this just this notion of saturation. So I'm just going to plug it into the sort of the one place I can do so. And then uh, if you just work out the algebra, you will get sort of this conclusion. And I'm happy to walk through this algebra, but in some sense, there's nothing. You know, there's only one thing I could possibly do uh, in this proof, and it just sort of works out. So this is the, the algebra that guarantees this. Okay. And the second lemma is the following. I, I've put it in this slightly weird looking way, uh, but I think the easiest way to process it is sort of in this proof. It says that the fraction of good points in S prime, so T prime, size of T prime over size of S prime is at least the beta to the minus one half over K. 
which is equivalent to the lemma statement. Uh, in other words, so recall beta is the fraction of overall points that remain. So it's some, it's some quantity less than one. So it's, a, it's saying that as, um, so in particular, this uh, right-hand side here is strictly larger than one over K, right? And it says that as, as S prime gets smaller, which is what beta prime is, right? Beta prime is a fraction of points in S prime uh, over S. As set S prime is, is decreasing, then the fraction of good points is actually increasing within S prime if it's saturated. And again, this proof, there's nothing happening. There's only one inequality I'm allowed to use. So I'm just gonna use it in the one place I could possibly use it. And this is the conclusion that I get. All right, so I'm happy to walk through this, but hopefully this makes sense to everybody already. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So again, so there's the, these are the two properties. So saturated sets can't be too small. And if the saturated set is small, then the fraction of good points within it is like increasing or it's, it's Okay, and now sort of we come to one of the, you know, this is the generalization of uh, the fact three that will be important for us. And it's really because we chose parameters in a way that allows us to do so. So lemma, let S prime be a saturated set of points, satisfying that the uh, empirical covariance of S prime has spectral norm, which is at most order beta to the minus one half. Then the empirical mean of S prime is close to mu star. So the true mean, it's at most something order root k. And the proof is we're just gonna plug the quantities that we have and the two lemmas that we proved into fact three. So, you know, the first inequality is fact three. Um, this is our assumption. And then this statement is just applying the, the second lemma that we had before. And you can see if you do so, everything's sort of magically canceled, right? The beta to the one halves cancel and S primes cancel and you're left with a K times some constant down in front. So you have order K plus size of S over K times size of S prime. And now we apply the first lemma, which says that, you know, S prime cannot be too small, particularly as at least the one over K squared fraction of the points to say that this term, the second term here is at most K as well, because one of the K squares cancels with this K and then you're done. So you just go order root K overall. And again, from the same logic as before, um, if instead of having bounded spectral norm, my 10K Thigen value is upper bounded by beta to the minus one half, I'm already, I'm done as well. In the sense that there's a linear time algorithm which outputs a, you know, a list of not too many things such that one of them is close. And again, the reason is I'm going to uh, project into the subspace uh, of the top 10K eigenvalues and this takes time or O tilde N DK. Within the subspace, I can use my fact to still list a, uh, learn a short list, such that there one of them is close to the truth because my dimension is 10k. And outside the subspace, uh, the previous lemma says that the empirical mean of my subset is close, and then I can just you know Pythagorean theorem. So I can form overall hypotheses by just stitching these together, and then I'm done. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. So that says that essentially all we need to do is find some you know, procedure that removes points, but which ensures saturation as we do so. Right, so we just need to ensure that we're saturated in every iteration with respect to our current set of points. And we will do so by using a, some, uh, at a high level, a filtering method, which is very similar to previous works on robust statistics, but uh, it turns out it, it, it's, it's it's using some, something different in this setting. And in this setting, sort of what filtering will refer to is the following procedure. We're, we're given a set of points S and we define scores tau one through tau N, a non-negative scores. And what filtering will do will output a set S prime where each point is in S prime independently with probability one minus tau I over tau max, where tau max is the maximum tau I. Okay, so note that this procedure always strictly decreases the size of the set because if tau i is tau max, like whatever i achieves tau max will remove, get removed with probability one. Uh, and I should say, technically this is the randomized version of filtering and 
there's actually a deterministic version of filtering where instead of actually removing points uh, with probability one minus tau i over tau max, you assign weights to the points and you downweight their weights multiplicatively so, by doing so. And it's really just multiplicative weights. So there's, there's nothing new uh, under the sun. And for, for a number of reasons, one of which I'll explain just in a second, we actually use as a deterministic variant in the paper, but I think it introduces a bunch of notation that I don't want to get into. And for the, the sake of everything, it's, I think the randomized version conveys everything that uh, one needs to understand for this. Okay, and what is the guarantee of filtering? Well, in this setting, the main guarantee is the following. So if I have this set S and these score, now negative scores, and suppose they satisfy the following property, that is the average set of scores for points in T is at most one half of the average overall set of scores, which is a somewhat different uh, condition than one might be used to if you're used to sort of the traditional robust statistics setting. But if you have this condition that the average um, is small, then if that's prime as the outcome of filtering S with these scores, then you have the following condition, which you know, if I remove the expectations and sort of squint, it says that uh, my set of points is saturated. But I have this weird expectation theory. Um, but, you know, so S, S prime is some saturated in some expected sense. And this is why we want to deal with the, um, the deterministic version, uh, because this, these expectations are a little bit annoying. But you can de-randomize this guarantee by using the deterministic filter. And so for the rest of the talk, I encourage you to think of these expectations as not being there. Okay. But this is the main guarantee that if I, satur if I, if I filter uh, using these scores, then in expectation, my set is saturated in some weird sense. And really it is saturated if I just use a deterministic version of the filter. So that means if I just wanna always ensure saturation, I just need to define these sets of scores uh, which satisfy this property. And I will say that a set of scores that satisfy this property are safe. Okay, and let me just prove this uh, lemma very briefly. Sorry, Jerry, can I ask a quick question? W when you, um, you prove this bounding expectation, so there's two things you could go, right? You could go to high probability or you could go to uh, completely de-randomized. Is there a way to make this high probability? Like, do you have any criterion you can optimize by re-randomizing until you get what you want? And can you check uh, that you get some better solution every time? It's it's difficult to check, I think, just because you don't know what like T prime is. I, I you, you probably can, uh, like just because with very high probability, because, you know, I'm sampling, filtering samples things independently. So I will probably, you know, with like prob with just like turn off bounds, except in exceptional circumstances, I will satisfy something which is very close to this, maybe up to like constants, um, you know, with probably one minus, you know, X of whatever. Uh, so you probably can do randomize it or just, just use the randomized version and you will be, you will be okay, but it's just slightly nicer in all senses if you, if you don't do it that way. Uh, so there's yeah, like everything probably works with high probability. But, yeah. Okay. Sorry, but the, <clears throat> so I mean, Philippe's question is sort of, can you like re-randomize and like check some safety condition yourself? But I guess the answer is that you can't check the condition because you don't know what the, the subsets are, right? But it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is, it is satisfied, you know, with some small constant or sub-constant loss with very high probability. So you could just run it and just check at the very, very end if, if your hypotheses make sense, for instance. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but for all these obnoxious reasons, it's slightly better to work with the deterministic filter. But the proof of this lemma is very straightforward. Let's compute these quantities. Uh, so let me, compute this quantity delta t, which is one minus the quantity I actually care about. Uh, so it's side, it's like the, the fraction of points that I, I remove from t um, in expectation. Well, what is this? I, I have an exact uh, you know formula for this. It's one over one size of t times uh, tau i over tau max. And I also have the same thing for s. If I, were, I just have one over the size of s times tau i over tau max. And the sum is now over all the points in S, not over all points in T. And by assumption, you know, delta T is at most one half delta S. This is my assumption of safety. And then, you know, our claim is equivalent to just saying one minus delta T is at least 
square root of one minus delta s, but this is true um, because of this Taylor expansion. And then the claim just follows from rearranging. Okay, so that's the entire proof. And uh, I should say, really, there's nothing magical in some sense about the square root. I mean, the, these constants one half are somewhat arbitrary. So you can you can also get away with like some other other powers. Really, the reason why we choose this 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 weird looking saturation condition, like this is really what we care, this is really what the safety condition implies, but this doesn't compose well if you if you do this many, many iterations in a row, um, but saturation does. So this is why we, we like the saturation formulation of the problem. Okay, so now how do we design safe scores? This is sort of the final bit. If my computer will, uh oh, okay. So let S prime be our current set of saturated points. Our assumption is that the 10k eigenvalue is large, right? Because otherwise we're done. Otherwise we have this, this whole thing that says that we're, we're happy. But this should be kind of suspicious if you think about it. We should only really expect at most k large eigenvalues, right? Think uh, like even in the mixture model setting, we, we should only have k large eigenvalues, but here we have 10k large eigenvalues. So there's like you know, 10 times more large eigenvalues than we should naively expect. And one should expect that you can design a set of scores that explores this. And this is what we were going to do. Uh, and the most naive way of doing this, my claim is the following. If V is a subspace spanned by these 10K large eigenvalues, define tau i to be the, uh, well, I center my set of points at their mean. I project them onto the subspace and I take the L2 norm squared. And the reason why this is natural is because if I do this, my computer will unfreeze. Uh, you know, if I take any set of points, I center them and I take their L2 norm squares, uh, their average is the trace of the covariance matrix. But since I projected onto this the span of the top 10k eigenvalues of my covariance, the sum of these scores will simply be the sum of the uh, top 10k eigenvalues of my covariance matrix. And there's a bunch of algebra here that says that this is the case, but hopefully this is fairly standard. And let me just denote this by the following notation, which is the, you know. okay, so this is, this is why one might hope that these scores do well, because if I do so, then the overall sum of the points in S uh, is just the, you know, the sum of the top 10K eigenvalues, which I assume to be quite large, because each individual eigenvalue is quite large. But, you know, the safety condition has two parts. It needs, to, or it really has that I need that the, the sum of the points in some of the scores in T is at most, or the average of the scores in T is at most half of the average of the points overall. And this is sort of the problem here. Because I can compute the, the scores or the average of the scores in T, but it's not great. Because when I do so, uh, there's a problem because I want to do the same computation, but I'm centering at S prime, but I should be centering at T prime or the 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 the, the expectation of T prime. And this is really the only real difference. So, you know, I, I split, I, you know, if I do so, I center at T prime, I get this additional term, which is the, the L2 norm dis difference between the, the, the true mean or the, the mean of T prime and the mean of the overall points in S prime. This first term uh, is just the covariance of the good points. This term is totally fine. This term is small because the, the, the covariance of the good points is bounded. But we have this other term. And the only way we can bound the second term here, the, the L2 norm difference between uh, the true mean and the set of point and the, and the mean of the points in T prime is by using our fact three, this sort of geometric lemma. But when you do so, uh, and you do a little bit of math, what you get is you get the following expression. You get the spectral norm of the covariance of S prime times K times this beta to the one half factor. And this is for the problem of this. Because if you if you put things together, what you would need is this following condition. So ignore this 11k term out in front. Technically, actually, that's not quite true. This is, this is not actually. I just realized the, the correct expression. But if you're if you caught that, you're paying very close attention. So hopefully nobody is. Um, but morally, what's going on is that what you have on the right hand side is the sum of the top 10k eigenvalues, and on the left hand side you have k times the largest eigenvalue. Right, and of course. This is, is not guaranteed to be the case that this holds unless these eigenvalues are somewhat uniformish. But there's no reason a priori why these eigenvalues need to be uniformish. 
right? So again, yeah, the first part is fine. But in general, this is just not true, right? I can imagine a scenario when there's one very, very large eigenvalue and there's, you know, nine or 10K minus one large, but not that large eigenvalues. So what we need to guarantee is that, yeah, there's, there's no good cluster, which is really far away from everything else. But it turns out there's a really, really easy hack that gets around this. And it just, you just whiten all the directions to ensure that they look the same. So in the top 10K directions, I just uh, compute their covariance and I, I force the points to have identity uh, covariance in these top 10K directions. And then I compute the scores of these whitened points. So formally, I let ZI be sigma to the, sigma Y to the minus one half where sigma Y is the empirical covariance of the projected points times Y my, minus their mean. So these points are k-dimensional points, um, and their mean is zero, and their expectation and the covariance is identity. And the point is that when I do this whitening operation, uh, my assumption is that the all the eigenvalues um, are at least ten beta to the minus one half. So this operation of whitening is strictly contraction; everything squishes down. And now I just redefine tau i to be the means to to be the the square norms of these points. And the point is the following. Uh, by the same calculation as before, the average of the scores overall is still the trace of the covariance, which I've just forced to be 10K. And the contribution from T prime uh, is squished down because now there are no large directions. I've just forced all the directions to look the same. Uh, and if I just you know run through the same calculation as before, sort of the first term is still okay. Right? This first term is still very, very small. This is, this is not the problematic term. The problematic term was always the mean deviation term. But the mean deviation term is also small now because all the eigenvalues are uniform. And uh, there's nothing really I can convey. Just if you just go through these calculations, just the fact is now because all the eigenvalues are the same, everything is fine. And this, this is just a really nice, trick, I don't have great intuition for why it works, but it just it just kind of magically makes all the, because all the eigenvalues now are the same, uh, the overall sum of the good points is something like at most 3k. And then now you're done because recall all we needed was that the average of the good scores is like half of the um, overall scores overall, which, were, which is like 10k. And so you're done. So now overall, if I, this is the entire algorithm. I have a data set and I just iteratively do the following procedure. While the 10K tagging value is too large, larger than this 10 times beta to the minus one half, I let V be the span of the 10K largest eigenvalues. I compute these whitened scores. I filter. And then when, whenever I exit this loop, I use, I would just return a list using our lemma. So within the span of the, largest 10k eigenvalues, uh, you know, randomly sample, and outside just output the empirical mean. And let's just uh, guarantee that I, this actually works. So clearly, whenever I exit, I, I will be done because you know my 10k eigenvalue is not too small. Every iteration of this loop runs in time ndk because I claim the bottleneck is just finding the span and projecting. Uh, and this loop must terminate because in every iteration, I remove at least one point. And so there's at most n iterations. Each iteration takes n dk time. And so this is n squared dk. So that's it. OK, so now I will spend like one minute on making it fast, because really, there's nothing I think that one can convey about this in an hour long talk anyways. But at a high level, it turns out this is the correct slow algorithm to speed things up with. Um, and this, this previous algorithm really is slow. There are scenarios you can come up with where each iteration of the loop only removes one point. But what, what we really want to do is encourage that the 10K eigenvalue decreases really fast. So the, the, the point is you need to sort of combine the previous framework with a better optimization technique that decreases this potential function much faster, this potential function being the 10K eigenvalue. And this is a fairly well understood recipe by now. This literature, the idea is that you take these simple slow algorithms um, and you essentially do things with uh, fast matrix optimization, specifically 
in this case, a variance of matrix multiplicative weights. And you, this is this is what works. But there's a lot of technical details which I will not get into, which I will just flash to you know demonstrate technical merit. Uh, but really, there's nothing. Essentially, we need to do all these tricks to to use. Uh, we need to like devise a new method based on Kaifan or lazy mirror descent for the Kaifan norm. And then like a variety of other tricks, which again is impossible to convey in a one hour talk, in my opinion, but it all works out. And yeah. But really, I don't ever really expect to convey this. Uh, hopefully if you understood the, the, you know, the simple algorithm, I'd be more than happy. So that's pretty much all I want to say. Uh, there are a number of very interesting future directions. The one thing I didn't point out is that this algorithm that I'm uh, that we developed in the end, it sort of solves one uh, a primitive, which is finding this top 10k eigenvalue or the subspace robustly. Um, so it actually is a way of performing robust PCA, which is just robust against outliers. Because what it's doing is it's ensuring in the end, right, that the 10k eigenvalue is small. So I think this is really nice sort of self-contained primitive. I think this school could have some very nice real world applications as well. So one very nice direction I'm looking into is sort of implementation. Uh, another interesting direction is uh, trying to break this NDK sort of barrier, even for learning mixtures of K things. And also just uh, applying this uh, framework to more complex object objectives. Because I, th I think this simple algorithm is very nice. It's, it's very general, you're not really using that much structure, but you're using all the structure there is sort of precisely. So that's pretty much all I had. Thank you very much. Are any questions? Uh, let's thank Jerry and we have time for a question or two.